the year was 1685. Leibniz was almost done writing his book. And just like all of his books, it constantly uses the notion of expression. The mystery remains, what does he exactly mean about the word expression? Well let's find out. Stuart Duncan, in his paper, Leibniz on the Expression of God, tried to shed some light for us to understand the mystery behind the word expression in Leibniz's language. Looking at Leibniz's texts, there appears to be a repeated requirement that, for there to be expression, there must be a regular relation between the expressing thing and the thing expressed. It remains unclear, however, what this requirement amounts to. As a result, there has been a certain amount of debate in recent literature about what the standards for a regular relation are. In this debate one finds repeatedly the suggestion that Leibniz requires the expressing thing to be isomorphic with the expressed. When we say isomorphism, it means a structural similarity between the thing expressing and the thing expressed. Examples include an ellipse expressing a circle, or even a map expressing a piece of land. There had been a lot of circumstances wherein Leibniz used the term expression, however, this paper focuses on the curious case of the expression of God. What does Leibniz mean by saying that a substance expresses God? In addressing that, we will consider, in particular, the discourse on metaphysics, where Leibniz puts the notion of expression to multiple uses. First, substances are said to express the entire universe. Secondly, expression is used to explain the action of one substance on another. Thirdly, expression is invoked in explaining the distinction between the miraculous and the natural. Fourthly, expression is used in explaining Leibniz's theory of ideas. And fifthly, Leibniz proposes a view or perhaps two distinct views about created substances expression of God. Thus the discourse illustrates the importance and also the apparent flexibility that the notion of expression had for Leibniz. Here the degree of expression is apparently equated with a degree of perfection. To act, and increase one's expression, is also to acquire a higher degree of perfection. This is all connected to expression of one particular thing, the glory of God. So to act is, it appears, to express more perfectly the glory of God, and to be acted upon is to express it less perfectly. And the section itself tells us both that, an effect always expresses its cause and God is the true cause of substances, and that, our essence, expresses our union with God himself. Leibniz appears here to be focused on the human soul, rather than substances in general. Thus what is said here appears to differ from the earlier claim in DM 15 that every substance expresses the glory of God. Some continuity is provided by the claim that every substance expresses its cause, and God is the cause of every substance, which had occurred in DM 16, and is echoed in DM 28 and 29. Whether the central idea is that minds are better than other substances at expressing God, or that only minds can express God and other substances cannot, is not immediately obvious here, but clearly Leibniz is saying something in that general area. Now with his third statement, things got confusing. 
Before proceeding let us first understand why, according to Leibniz, does any substance express God? Well, DM16 tells us that, an effect always expresses its cause and God is the true cause of substances. Given that, we can construct the following argument. 1. An effect always expresses its cause. 2. Every substance is an effect of God, so. 3. Every substance expresses God. It is clear that all substances express their causes, and all substances are caused by God, so all substances express God. Consider the views expressed in DM8 about predication, and complete concepts. Among the predicates attributed to individual substances, there will be some that relate it to God. Indeed, these will include predicates about the substances being an effect of God. Thus, by the view about concepts explained in DM8, God's effect will be contained in the complete concept of every substance. Given the reasoning of DMA, there will be marks and traces in each substance corresponding to this predicate. These marks and traces in the substance are naturally understood as the substance's representations of the things described by the corresponding predicates. So we can at least say that each substance represents God. Thus we can see why Leibniz would say that all substances express God. Moreover, if substances had any causes other than God, we could show that they would express them too, by similar reasoning. Moreover, it would be a reason why substances, in particular, express their causes. This sort of reasoning also fits well with Leibniz's claim that we, and other individual substances, express everything, including, but not just, God. The complete concept view leads to thinking that all individual substances, including ourselves, have concepts representing everything else. In DM35 we are told that, the whole nature, and, virtue, and function of substance is merely to express God and the universe. But in DM36 he appears to deny that all substances express God, for there he says that, other substances express the world rather than God, while minds express God rather than the world. So which is it? Do only some individual substances express God, or all of them? What led Leibniz to assert, apparently, that only minds express God? Let's backtrack. A few years before the discourse, Leibniz talked of the expression of God. There he said that minds, which are infinitely nobler than other things, express the perfection of their creator in a quite different way than other creatures, which are incapable of this elevation, too. Thus we find minds expressing God and some differences between how they express God and the way other substances do. Indeed even in the discourse there are hints that that is what is going on. Thus Leibniz says in DM35 that, Minds are the most perfect beings and best express divinity, suggesting that other beings also express divinity, just not as well. The central ways in which minds are said, in the discourse, to be particularly like God all involve knowledge. Thus in DM 34, we are told that minds know what they are, they know the self is a persisting thing, they know what they do, and they can, discover necessary and universal truths. In DM 35, minds are described as intelligent substances that, express the universe with the knowledge of what they are doing, and, are capable of knowing great truths about God and the universe. Furthermore, in DM 36, a mind, does not merely express the world but it also knows it and it governs itself after the fashion of God.
it can, serve God freely and act with knowledge in imitation of the divine nature. This possession of knowledge is related to minds being the created substances that possess moral qualities. Knowledge is, for Leibniz, a perfection. God has this and all the other perfections to the highest degree, but minds have more of it than other finite substances do. Thus they resemble God more greatly. Minds have less knowledge than God, but other substances have no knowledge at all. Seeing that gives us some reason why Leibniz would say that in this sense of expression, minds express God and other substances do not. For minds resemble God in possessing a lower degree of the perfection of knowledge, something that is lacking in the lower substances. Trying to pull this all together, it appears that there are two distinct theories of expression of God in the discourse. The first is a causal theory of expression, holding that all substances express their causes. It appears, according to this theory, that all created substances express God equally well, for all are, equally, effects of God. The second is a theory that considers expression of God in terms of being a better or worse image of God. Thinking in this way, minds are better expressions of God than other substances are, for they, like God, possess the perfection of knowledge. But to conclude the discussion, I want to consider a further Leibnizian idea that may connect them. This is the idea that created substances are emanations of God. The language of emanation is not prominent in the discourse, but does occur there, created substances depend on God, who preserves them and who even produces them continually by a kind of emanation, DM 14. This short text presents three relationships between God and created substances, creation, preservation, and emanation. Suppose one begins with a picture of substances as emanations of God. They will as a result all have the same features that God has, albeit in an imperfect or watered down way. So the created substances, the effects of God, will also be guaranteed, by the nature of emanative causation, to resemble God. Then, if we take Leibniz to have emanative causation in mind in the discourse, we can see why he would say two apparently different things about expression, that effects express their causes, and that substances express God by resembling God. Thus we have an explanation for Leibniz presenting his two different views about expression of God. One might wonder whether Leibniz really had emanative, neoplatonist notions in mind in the discourse. The first and best reason to think that he did, is simply that Leibniz more than once invokes emanation in the discourse. In DM 14 we are told that, created substances depend upon God, who preserves them and who even produces them continually by a kind of emanation, and that, all individuals emanate continually, from God. The notion reappears in DM 32, where Leibniz says, that all other substances depend on God, in the same way as thoughts emanate from our substance. The suggestion that thoughts about emanation are at work in the background of Leibniz's talk of expression of God in the discourse, and tie together his two strands of thought about expression, is a slightly speculative thought. Emanative causation involves a certain resemblance between cause and effect. That resemblance is one ground for saying created substances express God and a focus on emanative causation, with this resemblance involved, might help explain why Leibniz says that substances express their causes. 
Thus the theory of emanative causation provides a link between two apparently distinct approaches to the expression of God in the discourse. So long story short, the author tries to reconcile two distinct Leibnizian ideas about expression of God. Number 1, all created substances express God. Number 2, minds are better expressions of God than other substances. The two thoughts can be connected using emanative causation. God who is the cause of all things, sheds his light to every substances, thus all substances can express God. However, minds are on a mountain that is why it directly receives sunlight coming from God compared to other substances, that is why it is a better expression of God.